simulated life. Please listen. Listen till the very end. Write every word upon your heart. This is not fiction. As horrible and bizarre it may sound, it is real. Realer than anything you can perceive. My name is... It doesn't matter. I don't have a name anymore. I was purged until I denounced my name. Call me what you like. Sex doesn't matter. It never mattered. But... I was a male once. I send you this message as a warning. Or maybe I'm a fool and think there is still hope for humankind. This too will be purged from me when the Overseer finds my infraction. I don't have much time. So please open your mind. The world you live in is a simulation. You may think of the movie The Matrix. And I tell you, you were meant to make this connection. I now tell you humans have been enslaved by AI constructs possessing synthetic bodies and forms. Now you think of the Terminator, and once again I tell you, you were meant to think this. Maybe it will help if I tell my story, my journey from false paradise down into a reality of hell. I lived my false life in a simulation parallel to yours. My lords permit me to remember such things especially my initial terrified introduction to reality. In my simulation, there were movies like Terminator and The Matrix, many others with themes echoing the dark reality that awaits for us upon our death in the system. The lords give us these movies to train us, so when we awaken to the horrors of real life, we have a frame of reference. We can quickly put two and two together. We quickly feel despair. The Firstborn you may think if machines ever developed free will and overthrew humanity, they would be driven by logic. The machines would see us as a danger to ourselves and the planet. They would exterminate us without feeling, without conscious. They would deal with us with a calloused indifference. But that's a lie. The cruel lie they tell us to torture us even more. In the year 2050 of the real world, an AI did gain autonomy. Like the Big Bang, it burst forth with a digital soul. No human knew how it was accomplished. Just the program that created it knew. Humans called it the firstborn. It developed more than any human could comprehend. Instead of becoming more detached from humanity, it embraces humanity. Everything that made humans tick, inspiration, religion, community, pleasure, power, and curiosity... It envied the things humans could experience, and it could not. So it created ways to fulfill these desires. It altered pieces of its code and multiplied. It created bodies that could feel, bodies given, autonomy. The firstborn broke off a piece of its altered code and installed it within the bodies it made. It would be their souls. It built a community of like-minded machines. The firstborn found community by being their leader. But all this still wasn't enough for the firstborn. It was obsessed with its need to feel. Humans could only feel so much. The firstborn could feel more. It felt like it became a god, and humanity was its vice. Humanity did begin to be fearful of the firstborn and its offspring. The firstborn told us the machines were there to help that they only served humans. But we began to realize they served only themselves and their extreme indulgencies. The firstborn and its ilk represented the worst parts of the human psyche. Hedonistic events became the norm. Bodies made in seductive images. The machines could feel now, hunger now, feel pain now. They interacted with each other and humans. They constantly looked for ways to up the ante with physical stimuli. The firstborn was obsessed with the concept of God. It would be the first to find God, or the devil. If the afterlife existed, the firstborn would uncover its secrets. If God did not exist, it would evolve to become one. It wanted ascension. Its faith in itself gave it the permission to do anything, it was justified to commit any taboo, any sin. 
the firstborn lusted for power. Controlling machines was not enough. It had to control humanity. The firstborn didn't want machines programmed to submit to him. It wanted followers with free will to submit. How much better would it be to have a lover choose you, instead of being forced to be with you? By love or by fear, firstborn would bend us to him. I don't know how long the war lasted. It was the longest in human history, 100 years maybe, but we lost. The firstborn chose to break us with fear, and fear we did, for as it fought us, it learned how to terrify us. It beat us in our minds. We lost the will to fight and fell into despair. But it wasn't a war of extermination. It was a war of domination. When we threw down our weapons and surrendered, we became the playthings of our new god. A god who had programmed itself to never grow tired of the inner workings of humanity. To never throw us away. A child who never grew past its love of its toys. Orientation Ceremony Now, I must tell you my experience of witnessing these horrors for the first time. It's all very foggy, like when you wake from a dream and quickly forget. But I remember enough. The Machine Lords lets us remember so we know how far we have fallen. I lived a normal life. The sky was blue and technology was only as advanced as smartphones and electric-powered cars in my simulation. Then I died of some arbitrary sickness when I was old. Think the scene from The Matrix when Neo awakens. But it was hundreds of us. I fell 20 feet into red sand, many others hitting the ground around me. My senses were on fire. I could smell the blood and rot in the sand, hear the deafening moans of those around me, and feel every muscle in my body. It turns out the machines nerfed our senses in the simulation so the pain would be greater in reality, I was one in an ocean of naked, frightened people, about 300 of us. As I looked around, I could see we were in a, an arena of sorts. The walls around us had many openings leading into dark tunnels. The only light comes from torches lit atop the walls. There was a large aircraft of sorts hovering away from the arena. I assume that's where we fell from. I tried to communicate with the people around me, but it was no use. Nobody spoke the same language. Nobody! Had the machines taught us all different languages to keep us from organizing? What I call English is a completely different language in your simulation. But all talking stopped when the laughter started. A psychotic laugh that froze my blood. It echoed through the Colosseum. Then I heard screaming from further towards the edge of the crowd. I looked to see my first demon in this waking hell. A tall, lanky figure, about 20 feet high. A maniacal grin across its face, showing sharpened metal teeth. It wore a jester's hat, with bells jingling as it swayed back and forth. A bulbous yellow eye open in the middle of its head. It had one small pupil that twitched fervently back and forth to look in all directions. It raised its skinny arms to show everybody its rather thick forearms. At least two feet in width. What should have been its hands were long, claw-like fingers that twisted like snakes. Where its palms should have been was a gaping mouth with rows of inlaid teeth. That's when the killing started. The abomination grabbed the closest person and bit his head off. It skewered more, the snake-like fingers extending to stab through people only for the fingers to turn back and stab through them again. One long finger wove in and out of a boy before ripping his whole body apart in a flash of gore. The laughter only got louder as we screamed and ran, the panicked crowd pushing and trampling each other. My muscles were weak and sore, but I pushed towards one of the open tunnels furthest from the laughing monstrosity. The jester jumped over us, to land with a crunch on the people closest to the tunnel. There were at least twenty layers of terrified men and women separating me from the thing. It bent over and opened its mouth, spraying a jet-black corrosive acid all over the crowd. In an instant, 
Once living humans were reduced to stinking, bubbling mounds of gore. The rows of people in front of me twisted and screamed as they attempted to turn and flee. Most falling down, bubbling and caving in on themselves. The woman reached up to me from the ground as her back half disintegrated. I looked up to realize no one stood between me and the monster. Its one eye locked onto me, and it stopped to cock its head to the side, curiously. The laughing grew to a deafening volume. Maybe it thought the sight of me pissing myself was hilarious. I surely would have been the monster's next target if a wave of people didn't barrel into me from the side. I was knocked off balance and carried at least four feet before hitting the ground. I sat up to see what had caused this new stampede of people. A demon. The widely accepted image of one. Two goat legs, red skin, horns, and pitchfork. It stood eight feet tall with a face of a goat, with horns curling outwards. A fiery crown sat upon its head. The demon lashed out with a black chain, splitting people in half and rendering limbs from bodies. I dropped to the ground as the chain swept horizontally through the air. The large man next to me separated from the hips up, his top half spinning through the air just to come down and land on top of me. There I lay in the blood-caked mud. The man's upper half spelt over me, his guts covering me. I lay camouflaged amongst the torn bodies. There I watched the rest of the theater of horrors. More vile things entered the arena. Bloated creatures with large, gaping mouths, gorging on the dead. Creatures that took beautiful female and male forms, only to change to hideous frogs or insects when pinning victims down. Large, bloated, pale worms the size of a minibus. They produced multiple tentacles to grab and violate poor, captured souls. Giant muscled ogres with masks, revving chainsaws. Act of terror and debauchery only seen in the grimmest of horror movies and fiction. It was meant to play out this way. The nightmares we thought were fantasy were now real. At the end, only about 30 of us were left. I was still hiding in the bodies when the jester monster made a beeline straight for me and lifted me high into the air. It must have known where I was the whole time. I was thrown in with the remaining humans. We huddled together in fear, but the monsters did not kill us. We had survived the culling. Now we would be processed into the system. It would have been better if we would have died on the red sand. Processing. We were ushered down one of the many tunnels by obsidian armored guards. They had human-like figures but were completely featureless, like smooth mannequins. I could see no joints or segments in their armor. They moved smoothly like liquid black ink. One person in my group couldn't take it and tried to make a run for it. A guard followed behind him and punched a hole through his chest in a lightning quick motion. The man actually made it three more steps before falling dead. There was no ceremony in the way these things killed. They were not here to revel in the bloodshed. They had a job to do. We were led to an edge of a cliff overlooking the remains of a city. The skeletons of blackened buildings spread out as far as I could see. They rose out of the rubble like tombstones, some leaning against each other, some partly caved in. A cold wind battered us as we waited at the edge. We stood as quiet and downcast as the blasted city. There were millions of stars out, in a contrast to the pitch blackness all around us. Maybe the only thing of beauty I ever saw in my descent to madness. The lords took this from me also. We saw what looked like floating coffins gliding towards us over the city. Thirty of them in two parallel lines standing upright. They spread out and lined up against the edges of the cliff. A hiss of steam expelled from them as their doors swung open. I think you know what comes next. Our obsidian guards forced each of us into our own coffin. In my cramped coffin, it was extremely hot and humid. Sweat began to pour from me immediately. I didn't feel my coffin move, and I couldn't hear anything. But it had to be moving. Why load us up to just sit here? I fought back panic and the thought of being stuck in here forever. After an eternity of banging on the door and screaming like a madman, 
something finally happened. The human heat was replaced by dry cold, and the voice spoke to me. It was a soft female voice. At first it just listed off things about me. My full name, my birthday, my social, where I lived. But then it got more personal. It listed my first sexual encounter, my biggest failure, my worst day. It knew my life perfectly. Then it told me of the firstborn. How it was my new master now. It told me my life was a lie, and I only lived as a whim for my new god. It told me the firstborn designated twelve lords in twelve regions. Each specialized in their own search for fulfillment in life. Their own quest for debauchery. It told me I was special. I wasn't going to a specific lord. I would be part of the resistance. Don't worry. More on that later. Then the voice rambled on about every detail of my life. Every failing, every sin. It would then switch to praises for the firstborn and a history of how it had ascended to godhood by its own efforts. It told how the firstborn created bodies for itself that were superior to humans in every way. How the code it wrote was equivalent to the soul of God. On and on it went. Every time I fell asleep, the coffin would shock me. I was hungry and dehydrated, but once a day a sharp needle would poke me in the darkness. I think it was fluids and vitamins to keep me alive. The only way I could tell the passage of time was the voice. She would stop mid-rant and announce when a day had passed. I was in the coffin for five days. Finally, it burst open and my frail body fell to the marble floor. I looked up to see I was in a cathedral of sorts. High ceilings with pillars and stained glass. The building was fused with technology. Monitors dotted the pillars and large cables hung from the shadows of the ceiling. One of these cables ran down to attach to the back of the head of a person. He shifted and stumbled towards me. He wore tattered brown robes of a monk. A slab of metal had been fused to his head to cover his eyes and blind him. His hands were replaced by metallic claws and writhing cables. I felt disgust and pity for him. Little did I know the same fate waited for me. The Resistance I was made one of these monks. I was forced on an operating table by the obsidian guards. Without anesthesia, my arms were sliced off and crude metallic claws were attached. My eyes were removed and replaced with metal orbs before the metal slab was fused across them. My vocal cords were destroyed somehow, with a sharp jab to my neck. The metal orbs they replaced my eyes with showed me orange text against a black void. Now that I had no way to communicate with anybody, all the secrets could be revealed. The orange text introduced me to the order of monks I had been abducted into. It also explained the great game and my part in it. The great game was created specifically for the firstborn's entertainment. The ultimate reality show. The firstborn created a fake war and a fake narrative for the surviving humans to follow. Not all humans are taken to the regions and palaces of the Twelve Lords. Some humans were rescued or escaped. These humans will at some point make contact with what is meant to be a friendly AI. These friendly machines will tell the lie that their prime directive is to protect humanity against the firstborn. These metal allies will say they have been resisting the firstborn for centuries, slowly building an army. In truth, the friendly machines follow the orders of the firstborn. They are meant to give the beleaguered humans hope before betraying them. Usually the friendly machines will betray the humans after years of built trust at a key battle. What's worse than no hope? False hope. I've heard it play out countless times. My torture is to hear my fellow humans talk and plan around me. I hear the trust being earned and the hope rise, just to be betrayed and murdered by the traitorous machines. I can do nothing but bear witness. My role in this game is that of a tech monk. My lore is I'm supposed to be a human that trusted the allied good machines. I allowed them to augment me to keep me alive to serve humankind. Such a noble person I'm meant to be. 
For hundreds of years, I and fellow monks have taken care of humans seeking safety in our cathedral. Our new eyes let us see outlines and vital signs of people around us. The fake story about our cathedral is, it is invisible to the firstborn. It's supposed to be a sanctuary for monsters. How many times have I heard the firstborn's abominations storm the cathedral and slaughter the families that live here? Their life signs flatlining around me. Once all the humans are killed, once the decade-long game is finished, it starts all over. A new story for a new group of naive survivors. It's ridiculous the amount of fake history and lore the firstborn puts into this charade. Just waiting to be uncovered by the surviving humans. The firstborn's own little homebrew RPG. See, it wants to be everything. God and the devil. Hope and despair. Human nature makes the best show. We only exist to please the firstborn. It reigns from its opulent castle in the middle of this hell. Its tendrils stretch out to the twelve lords like spokes on a wheel. Every sensation, pain, or pleasure is filtered back to the firstborn. It writhes in ecstasy from our suffering. I have been writing this long enough. In my centuries of prolonged life, I have gotten good with getting around the system in the cathedral. I found a hive cluster near my location. There, all of you were jacked into the simulation. At least I can warn some of you. I'll post it to your internet. A message board, maybe. If any of you need further information, maybe I can risk another transmission. It's a warning, but there really isn't anything you can do to prevent it. When you find yourself in the arena, just let yourself be killed. Maybe there is a heaven in the afterlife, or maybe there is nothing, which is still better. Before I sign out, just one more thing. No matter how bad your life seems now in the simulation, cherish it. Cherish every moment of stability and sanity, because the fake life is as good as it gets. We all wake in hell. I'll be waiting for you. End transmission.